just stay standing if you would for a moment. So what you and I need, and oftentimes we don't, we don't think about it consciously, we have this subconscious need and desire to know that we have the favor of God upon our lives, that God is blessing us and keeping us. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, what I want you to do, let's pray together. I want you to ask the Lord to bless you. Now you say, I'm not really sure even what that means. So we're going to try to explain that to you in a moment. But you ask God to bless you, to open your heart so you can hear the truth of God and leave here today knowing of God's great care and love for you in your life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the, the powerful moments that we can sing out our faith and remind ourselves of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we come to this time where we open your word, may you speak eternal truth into our lives. May you remind us that there is a world to come, a world that is different, better, richer, fuller than the world that we are living in today. And that you have prepared us to be part of that world. I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your truth, to hear your word, and to live differently because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Really, really glad you're here today. If you're a guest, I I look forward to connecting with you after the service. It'd mean a lot to be able to put a name and a face together and try to help you on your uh, spiritual journey. If you've been coming for a little while but haven't connected deeply, uh, I don't do a lot here, but I can connect people and uh, would love to be a help in your life in that way. So <clears throat> let me just ask you a question. I'm going to be a little bit uh, more kind of hopefully personally reflective and, and uh, practical today as much as I can be. Do you ever have conversations in your head Am I, am I the only person that does that, or do you ever talk to yourself? Are you like me when things go good in your life, you, you're like, how did that happen? Right? And when things go bad in your life, you're like, why did that happen? You, you follow me? All right, so my, my recreational outlet of choice, it's not the only thing I do, but I enjoy playing golf, right? <clears throat> and it's it's... It's what, you know, it doesn't make me better than you it, that I play golf, but it's just, it makes me more interesting than you, okay? And that, you know, I just have these outlets. And, and so a microcosm of, of how we tend to view life is, right, I'll get to, um, for example, I'll get to the, to the to golf course first tee, I'll hit a shot, it'll go straight down the middle, and I'll think to myself, God loves me. I mean, because there can be no other explanation for that, right, at all in the world. And then like two holes later, I will hit a shot and it'll go out of bounds somewhere. And I'm like, okay, God, why do you hate me so much? You know, and I'll say, I'll say things like this in my mind, okay? I'm just being honest. I'll say things like, you know, God, I tried to serve you all week, and I only get this little four-hour opportunity to go, to just go play golf and relax and forget. And, and then you, you caused that to happen? What, what is it about me, God, that you want to punish me for that? Do you, do you ever have those kind of conversations where you're thinking, hey, how, how in the world do, how in the world does the good that happened in my life happen? And, and, and why in the world does the bad happen? The truth is, some of you are blessed and you feel guilty about it because you don't feel like you deserve it. Can I be honest? You, you don't deserve it right? And some of you are struggling with the difficult and hard things in your life, and you're wondering, do I deserve this? And you try to connect. What, what is it that, that caused that to happen? Th- this week, my air conditioner went out. <clears throat> and, you know, I was somewhere between, hey, I'm going to have to pay for a $125 service call or a $6,000 air conditioner. You know what I ended up with? The $6,000 air conditioner. And it's easy to think, man, why did those kind of things happen 
to me, what is it that caused that to happen? Our worldview is, is primarily formed through two ways. <clears throat> Three, actually, but two primarily. You are either a religious person, and a religious person by nature is a moralist, and a moralist looks at life and they say, hey, good people do good things, and good things happen to them. Bad people do bad things, and bad things happen to them. And so our worldview is really kind of based on this. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. And that works out pretty good until bad happens to a good person or good happens to a bad person, a bad person, somebody you don't like, right? When good happens in somebody else's life, you're like, why, God? Why would you bless them and not me? Right? That's a moralist. That's a religious person. A secular person is a relativist by nature, which, which li literally means that they don't ascribe to or apply mo a moralistic view uh, to, to what happens in life. So they think that the good in their life is the byproduct of hard work, education, um, decisions and choices that they make. And so they, they're a reductionist in the sense that they'll say, hey, good happens to me because I've worked hard for it. Let me tell you something. Neither the moral view or the relativistic view, the secular religious view, holds up in all situations. There has to be a way to look at life and say, why is it that good things happen to bad people like us? And why is it, how is it that good people can process and handle the bad things that happen in their life? And so what we're going to do is take this little passage of Scripture. Mark read it for you, and then he and Stephanie sang it so beautifully and powerfully. I kind of hope it's that, that, that kind of song that gets stuck in your mind, right? And you just keep thinking about it and singing it to yourself over and over again. This is oftentimes referred to as the Aaronic, A-A-R-O-N-I-C, for Aaron, an ironic, not ironic, but aironic blessing, or the priestly blessing. It's, it's a benediction to the first part of the book of Numbers. It's, it's really God's way of saying, hey, I've just taught you all this, now, now let me bless you. We, we don't do this formally. We're, we're not liturgical in, uh, in our and our approach to worship. If we were liturgical, we'd have a formal benediction, and a formal benediction is literally a good word spoken over you. So a good word would be something like this, the Lord bless you, right? And we would be saying, hey, we want you to go in or out of the blessing of the Lord in your life. This ironic blessing starts like this, number 622, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, on this wise shall you bless, literally speak a good word over the children of Israel, saying unto them, the Lord bless thee and keep thee and cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace and they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. This blessing is really thematic throughout Scripture. God blessed Abraham, sent him out. God used the blessing to go from Abraham to Isaac and from Isaac to Jacob. And Jacob, at the end of the book of Genesis, blesses all of his sons. It's really, it's really, in, it's, it's prescriptive and instructive for us on, on what does it really mean for us to seek the blessed life. Many of you, probably like we did on, on Thanksgiving as we gathered our family around, and we had prayer, primarily prayer over the food, a blessing, right, of thanksgiving for what God has provided for us. And so many times it's such an abstract thought. Today I want to try to bring that to real practical light for you and teach you what does it really mean to live a blessed life. First of all, I want you to see this, the nature of a blessed life. Let's just, we're just take this, this, these verses and just kind of unpack them. Verse 24, the Lord bless thee and keep thee, the Lord make his face to shine upon thee. The, the formal word for blessing is literally benediction. 
if you take benediction, it's two words. Bena, which is good. Diction, which is word. A benediction is literally a good word spoken over you. It does not mean that you will live a problem-free life. Nobody's going to do that. What it does mean is that you can connect meaning and purpose. You can see the underlying hand of God to what happens in your life. Now, we tend to be, like, like I tried to illustrate for you, we tend to, to want to interject what happens in our life to somehow God's favor and God's displeasure with us. For example, if your favorite football team did not win yesterday, that's not a sign that God does not love you, right? And if your favorite football team won this weekend, that does not mean that God loves you more than the guy that roots for somebody else. You with me? It's, that's not what it means. For God to bless your life. I love what Tim Keller said. And I want you to listen to this carefully. Good things seen as blessings. That is, when, when you have beauty and power and comfort, success, recognition, even plenty, but they're received without faith in God, they become curses. Hard things seen as curses, think weakness, deprivation, loss, and rejection, but received with faith in God will turn into blessings. So see, do you see the paradoxical reality there? What, what makes a difference in your life is not the outward um, uh, symbols or, or the outward evidences of what you think is blessing in your life. It's the reality that God is in control and he's working all things, both good and bad, together for your good in your life. Let me very quickly explain to you just by taking these phrases, what does it mean to live a blessed life? Well, first of all, it means this, that you know that God delights in you. That, that's the idea of the Lord bless you, which is simply a declaration, declaration that God takes delight in you. He does not wish, he, does, he, he is not just wishing well for you. He's actually committing to see that good come about in your life. Perhaps the, the, the best way to get this is, is in, and I'm going to come back to this story multiple times, but you remember Jacob and Esau were born, we, we talked about this in a series we did recently, drawing near to the presence of God, and, and remember Jacob had a desire for the blessing from his father. He had an inward emptiness that he felt like the only thing that could fill that inward emptiness is what his father would give to him, so he sought his father's blessing. He was looking to fill the emptiness of his life. What, what he was really hoping for is that, that his father would, would give meaning and purpose to him. And, and so in the Old Testament, a father would, would take his inheritance, he would divide his property and his wealth, and he would give them to his children as a way to bless them. It's literally, in, in that picture, it's the father's way of saying, I delight in you and I want to bless your life. I want you to get from me what you need, what will enrich you, help you, will help you to know that I love you and care deeply about you. So a part of living a blessed life is knowing that God delights in you, but it's also knowing that God is invested in achieving good for you. So he doesn't say the Lord bless thee, the, the blessing is actually this, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. In other words, the Lord is going to delight in you and he is going to take on the responsibility of making sure that that blessing becomes a reality in your life. He is going to invest at his own cost to make sure that good happens in our lives and that good is really part of his promise. I, I, have, I have four children. Um, some are here, and that doesn't matter. My, my youngest son is in college and, uh, in, in Virginia, and he, he left to go back this weekend, and we've, we've just had a great time with him. And, I, and I, I was thinking about this over the weekend. You know, he, he, he's like, uh, 
hey, Dad, do you think you could give me money for gas? And now if you know me and you know my relationship with my kids, I'm like, why would I give you money for gas? I know how much money you have in the bank. You got more than enough money in the bank to pay for your own gas. He goes, well, I just thought you'd, you know, you'd kind of help me out a little bit. I'm like, I am helping you out. I, I've paid all your expenses since the time that you were born, right? And I'm paying for you to go through college. And the sole reason I'm paying for you to go through college is so that you'll get a good enough job so that I can quit my job and you can take care of me the rest of my life. Right? That's why I kept having kids. I, I think I'm going to just divide the responsibility out for all of them. Now, <clears throat> when he left, you know what I said? I said, hey, I put $200 over in your account to pay for your gas. Say, why did you do that? Because if I'm going to bless him, I'm also going to keep him. In other words, I'm invested in, I am committed to resourcing him, right? So that the good, the blessing, the good word that I want for him comes to reality. Do you get that? God doesn't just say, hey, God bless you and good luck. God says, God bless you, and God keep you, right? So he is going to delight in you. He doesn't just delight in you. He's going to invest in achieving good for you. And then he's going to, here's the third thing, know that God's presence is accessible for you. And, and his face shine towards you. Again, I love these passages. They're so um, imaginative about really the whole narrative of Scripture. And so in the Old Testament, in the Garden of Eden, right, you have creation, fall, Genesis 1 and 2, creation, Genesis 3, the fall. And in the fall, Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They deliberately went against God's Word. They succumbed to the temptation of Satan, and they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that, that was sin, right? And they fell into sin. Their disobedience was sin before God. And, and up until that point, they had heard and lived in the presence of God, the face of God, every single day. And in the face and the presence of God, they had unhindered fellowship with God. They, they could communicate with God. They could come before the presence of God. And then when they sinned, Genesis 3, verse 9, they hid from the presence of the Lord. The whole Bible is this story. That when man fell into sin, they lost the face of God. And the whole Bible is about how do we recover the presence of God in our life? What is it that makes it possible for us to come back into a relationship with him? How do these promises that God is making to us, right? I'm going to bless you and keep you. How do they become real? And only when you get face to face with God, only when you get the face of God, do you get the inner poise and the confidence? Do you know for sure that in spite of what's happening in your outer life, in your inner life, you have deep assurance that God is completely for you? You see, go back to the story of Jacob and Esau. See, Jacob thought, I can't live without the blessing of my father. And he, he deceived and manipulated and, 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 and contrived to get it. And then one day he, he saw Rachel, who had become his wife, and, and he saw her beauty, and he said, I can't live without that. And he got Rachel, and by the way, the way he got Rachel and the way that he got the blessing from his father brought more problems into his life and he began to realize the things that I thought I had to have in order to live a full and blessed life, I really don't need those things. And then one day, he begins to wrestle with God. That's the, the Genesis 32 right story, and he, he's wrestling with God. And God's trying to throw him off. And Jacob says, I will not let you go 
unless you what? Bless me. See, he discovered that the only true have to have in his life was God's blessing. That's the only thing he can't live without. And until you realize in your life the only have to have is the presence of God and the promise of God and the blessing of God, your life will be very scattered, it'll be very uncertain, it'll be very shaky, it'll be very empty, it'll be very anxious filled. That's the secret, that's the, the nature of a blessed life. Let's talk about the secret to a blessed life. Now, again, we're just going to unpack this, this priestly blessing. He says here, and be gracious, in verse 25, and be gracious unto thee. When you come to that, you ought to circle the word gracious. Here's what it means, or here's the secret to a blessed life. A blessed life is an act of radical grace. See, when he says, the Lord bless thee and keep thee and cause his face to shine to thee and be gracious unto thee, he's saying there's no blessing apart from grace. The idea of God's graciousness to us is a reminder that blessing is not earned. It is given and received. So that means you are not blessed because of who you are. You are not blessed because of what you do. You are blessed because of what God does in spite of you. Do you get that? See, I, let, me, let me say this to you. I'm standing here before you today as a testimony of the grace of God. I did not end up where I'm at in my life because I'm smart. I did not end up where, where I am in life because of the family I was born into. I did not end up in life where I am in life because of of, of my education. I did, it, it's not that. You say, how did you get here? By the grace of God. That's it. Say, how did you get the wife that you have? By the grace of God. It wasn't charm and good looks. <laughs> Do you get that? It was grace. Say, how did you get the kids that you have? Genetics. <laughs> and the grace of God right? It's grace. If, if you begin to think, see, here's your problem. The, the minute you think, I, I've got what I've got because I deserve it, then, then when you lose what you have, now you've got a problem. It's grace. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means this. A blessed life is one that is free from the curse. See, you can't understand Blessing without putting it into the context of what happens when you are when you are not blessed See when he says here the Lord bless thee Well, if God doesn't bless you, then what does he do? He curses you See, that's the str struggle that so many of you have you you don't want to admit that you don't you don't want to come to the reality You don't want to actually verbalize it and say it out loud either you're blessed or you're cursed Go, go back to the story of Jacob and Esau. I want you to think this through and use your imagination and, and, and let the imagination help get you into gospel reality here. The, the story of Jacob and Esau is complex on so many levels. In, in fact, I've actually been teaching through this on, on Wednesday nights, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated and in, in the book of Romans. And it, it's conflicting and it's very complex to try to understand and so what Jacob is, is desiring from his father is a blessing that providentially and sovereignly God has assigned to him and said, you're going to get it. But he's trying to get it by manipulation and deceit. And, and Jacob is going to disguise himself. He's going to pretend to be Esau and he's going to go before his father and he's going to get his father to speak a word of blessing over him and in essence, give him the family inheritance, give him the family blessing that that the father thought he was going to be given to Esau the son. In that story, Jacob gets cold feet. You can look it up. It's Genesis 27, verses 12, 13, 14, in, in those verses. And he says to his mother, what happens if he finds me out? If he finds out that I'm actually not Jacob, but Esau, he will curse me. Maybe the most remarkable story 
and storyline that's developed out of that story is actually this. When he says to his mother, if he finds out he's going to curse me, Rebecca, Jacob's mother, says, let your curse be upon me. Here, here's, what, here's what Rebecca's saying. Jacob, in order for you to be blessed, somebody has to take the curse. Do you get that? She recognized that. It's actually an, an, an act of faith. Now, I'm not saying that, that she's perfect in the story. I'm not saying that their motivations were, 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 were wrong or right. And I'm not saying that the way they went about it was wrong. I'm just simply saying that, that she's, she's living out this very complicated thing, but she realizes as a step of faith, as an act of faith, that in order for him or anybody to be blessed, the curse has to be dealt with. And so she says, let me take the curse so that he, you, Jacob, can be blessed. You know what that is? That, that is an echo from Eden. That is, if you will, a, a, a timeless reality that is written into the moral law of the universe. And one day, Jesus Christ came and he came from eternity past. And he lived a perfect, sinless life. He was the Son of God, the only Son of God. And he went to the cross. And Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 that Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs upon the tree. Now, do you, do, you, do you get that? The only way you can be blessed is somebody had to take the curse. The only way that you get to a full, blessed life is that Jesus Christ, who deserved to be blessed, went to the cross and took your curse so that you could be blessed. The gospel is that everything we deserve fell upon Jesus in the form of a curse so that everything that Jesus deserved, blessing from God, could be made available for us. I'm, I'm reading this weekend, in fact, I've just about finished it. It's really an incredibly well-written book. It's called Echoes from Eden. It's by Jerem Bars. And he, he makes a case for uh, literature, um, a Christian view of literature, and, and he actually, in art, he, he actually has, has done a remarkable job of, of showing that, that in so much of literature and art, I think even entertainment, there, there's what he calls these echoes from Eden, this, this underlying narrative. And, and by the way, the underlying narrative of the world is always creation, right? And then the fall and then redemption. And if you don't connect creation, fall, and redemption, you don't have a complete story. Bars spends an incredible amount of time um, pointing out that writers such as C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien were masterful at telling the gospel narrative in their writings. And he tells, he retells in, through that gospel lens the story of the lion, witch, and the wardrobe. Now, let, let me stop here for a moment and say this to you. If, you if, if you're not a reader, you ought to read. If, if you can't read, you should have gone to Trinity Christian Academy. No, if, if you can't read, I'm, I'm being, that was, I was being facetious, okay? Funny, okay? That's, that, that, don't get mad at me, all right? If, if you don't read, at least watch the movie, okay? It, there is a movie. And it's not just entertainment, it's actually a gospel message, right? And, and in fact, you, you see it, like, let me just tell you a little bit about it so that, that you can find your way in the story. Aslan is the, he, he's the, the hero of the story, right? And he's the, he's the talking lion. He's literally, he's called in, in the lion, which in order, he's called the son of the emperor from, from across the sea. In other words, there's, he, he's a son of somebody that we've never seen before who's greater than you could ever imagine. And in The Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe, it's so much about, about creation, right? There's this beautiful world that these children enter into, a world that, that seems largely unspoiled until you come across this witch. And in the 
and the world of the witch, they're, they're trapped in what? They're, they're trapped in an eternal winter, right? An eternal winter without Christmas. Do you see how significant that is? Without the birth of Jesus, we're, we're, we are in a perpetual winter. And then you have in the story with the fall, you have this one of the, one of the, the, the children, Edmund, one of the four children. You have Peter and Edmund, Lucy and Susan, and, and Edmund is deceived by the witch, right? The Turkish delights. And so she, she gives them to him, and he takes them, and he justifies his action, and then it, it slowly dawns on him and becomes a reality that he has betrayed his family. He's betrayed Aslan, and he is cursed. And the climax of the whole story is that Aslan willingly gets up on the table, remember? And he dies. And he's killed. And Lucy and Susan think that the, 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 the world is over, that everything is ruined until Aslan comes back to life. And when they ask him about it, they say, what does this mean? And Aslan says that though the witch knew the deep magic, there's a magic deeper still which she did not know. Her knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time, but if she could have looked a little further back into the stillness and the darkness before time dawned, she would have read that there was a different incantation. She would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. The only reason, the only reason that you can know assuredly that you are going to live a blessed life is that Jesus willingly climbed up on the cross. He who had committed no treachery and died so that all of us who are traitors could live. And not just live, watch this, that death itself would start working backward. That redemption promises ultimate restoration. The assurance that everything in your life is going to turn out right. You see, you're only able to be blessed because Jesus, who did not deserve to be cursed, died in your place. He took your curse so that you could be blessed. And say, what's the evidence of a blessed life? I want to give this real quick. There's two things. One, it's inner peace. It's shalom, right? He says, and give you peace. You say, what is, what is shalom? It is the absolute and utter fulfillment of your deepest desires. It is the inner poise and grace and confidence that you know that your life is not... It's not defined, right, by what you have or what you accomplish. It is not defined by your greatest accomplishment. It's not defined by your worst failure. It's not defined by the sin that you committed in the last 24 hours. It is not defined by how well your kids behaved. It's not defined by the greatest accomplishments that you do in life. Your life is defined simply by this, that Jesus Christ the ultimate person who ever lived went on the cross and he died for you so that you would not have to be cursed. You're not defined by your critics. You're not defined by your enemies. You're not defined by your failures. You're defined by God's love for you through Jesus Christ. That's what gives you inner peace. Not only inner peace, but you get a new identity. He says here in number 6 and verse 27, and they shall put my name upon the children of Israel. Listen, l l this gets real practical in Christian living, right? So when, when we baptize people here, right, we baptize them in the name of the Father, name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. The reason that we baptize them that way is we're, we're making a public acknowledgement that, that God has put their name on those people. 
Do you know what happens? Think of a child who's abandoned, a child that's forlorn, a child that's all alone in the world, and he gets adopted. Say, what does he get? He gets the name of the parents who adopt him. What comes with the name? Security. Identity. Intimacy. The assurance that that family is going to take that child in and is going to commit themselves to the well-being of that child when you come under the blessing of God because Jesus has taken your curse. He's going to give you inner peace. And he's going to give you a new identity. You know when they gave this, this, this priestly blessing, they, they literally would speak it over the people. Say, why would they do that? Two things. I want you to take these away from, from here today. I want you to put this into practice in your life. See, the, the priestly blessing, the evidence of it is you'll, you'll actually want to seek more of God's blessing. You, you, it'll create, when you see it for what it is, when you see that you get it because of what Jesus has done for you, you'll understand that you need that more than you need anything else. It'll become the priority of your life to live with the blessing of God upon you. You see, if you have the light of God's face shining towards you, there's no way that the world around you can live in darkness. You need God's light. You need to seek it. But not only do you need to seek it, you need to give it. See, you're either a blessing or a curse in your relationship with others. C.S. Lewis rightly noted, he says, a person who habitually praises and compliments and affirms is a person that's filled with inner help. And a person who is always finding fault and always criticizing everybody is just the opposite. They're not filled with inner health. They're really filled with an inner sickness. Do you know that you can change the course of the life of other, lives of others around you by bringing God's blessing, by speaking God's blessing into their life? Let, let, me, let me tell you something. Let me, let me just real quick, I'm going to finish with this. My, my kids, I have four grandchildren. I had three got a fourth one about two weeks ago. Tomorrow will be two weeks. And my kids ask me a lot about parenting, not, not what I would call deep things, but just, just kind of casual, um, how do you or how should you? And, you know, I, I see this with parents. I'm not saying this about my children. I'm just saying in general with the young parents. They want their kids to be successful. They want their kids to be happy. They want their kids to have things. They want their kids to accomplish things. And, and by the way, I think that's normal. I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Don't, don't get me wrong. Let me tell you, and I, I've said this to my kids, and I'm saying this to you. Your kids do not need to be the greatest athletes that ever lived. Your kids don't have to be the smartest kid in every classroom. Your kids don't have to be the most popular kids at school. Your kids don't have to have all the things that, that you think, if you give them to them, that's going to help them to be happy. They, they don't need those things. You know what they need? They need people in their life that are going to introduce them to Jesus Christ. They're going to help them to live out the gospel. They're going to speak a benediction, a good word into their life. They need, to be, they need to be around people that when they see fruit in their lives, when they see gifts and talent in their life, when they see sacrifices and, and, and character in their life, that a good word is spoken over them. You need it. Your children need it. And the only way that you can know for sure, the only way that you can be absolutely certain that your kids are going to get, live a blessed life is that you have to point them to the cross and say, the reason you are blessed is because Jesus Christ loved you enough to take the curse for you so that you could be blessed. Do you see that? That is the echo from Eden. That is the ultimate meaning of the universe. The meaning of the world is this, that Jesus Christ loved you enough 
to go to the cross and take your curse so that you could be blessed. Would you bow your heads with me? Heads are bad, eyes are closed. I don't want you to miss this. I think so many times we, we live very abstract lives. We don't connect the dots. We don't really look at the reality of what God's doing in our life. And we miss so much. We miss a lot because we think it depends upon us. We think it's, it's all about how we perform. And we, 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 we live at the, at the high of our successes. We live at the lows of our failures. The way you find inner poise and inner peace and inner grace is when you come into a relationship with Jesus. Maybe today that's the, that's the deep emptiness of your life. That's the great struggle of your life. You don't know for sure that you're a child of God. You've never believed on Jesus. You never called out to him. You never asked him or invited him into your life as your, as your personal savior. You've never acknowledged that he went to the cross for you and took your curse so that you could be blessed. Maybe today you say, Pastor, include me in your closing prayer. I won't embarrass you. I won't call you by name. I won't come to where you say, but I pray for you by, by need. Just lift that hand up high. I'm not sure I'm a Christian, but I want to be and I need to be. Would you pray for me? Just lift that hand up high. High enough for me to see it. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless you. And you. And you. Somebody else. And you. And you. God bless you. Somebody else. Thank you. God bless you. Just lift that hand up high. In the back. I see your hand. Somebody else. Thank you. God bless you. Would you, would you stand quietly with our heads bowed, eyes closed for just a moment? I see your hand in the back. God bless you. Let, let me, if, if you raise your hand, let me help you. I don't always take time to do this, but I think it's important. The way that you come to faith in Jesus, the Bible says it this way. You believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus so today, if you're believing that Jesus died in your place on the cross, took the curse for you, then what I'm going to help you to do is confess Jesus by, by wording a prayer. I'm just going to say a simple prayer. And the prayer itself doesn't save you. It's believing in your heart and calling upon Jesus to come into your life. If you raise your hand, you've never prayed to receive Christ. You never put your faith and trust in Jesus. I want to help you to do that this morning. Your heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You, you pray silently while I pray out loud. Dear Lord, I, I know today that I deserve to be cursed. I know the only way that, that I can be blessed is through what Jesus did for me on the cross. I come to you in my sinfulness. I come to you in repentance. And today I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. That he died and he lives again that I might have everlasting life. And today I receive Jesus into my heart and life. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, here's what I want you to do. When Mark begins singing in a moment, our, our team begins to lead us in a closing song. There'll be people here at the front. I just want you to come and let somebody pray with you. Let somebody help you to to seal this decision in your life so that you can know that you know that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. You need to pray. The altars are open. God, work in your life. Father, speak to us today. Save souls. Speak to hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.